Okay, so should we, yeah, we can start. Um, so good evening and thank you all for, for coming. And uh, well, I, I'm sure uh, you, you won't regret it at all. And uh, uh, I'm sure those who, who didn't come because we're not the, that many people here this evening uh, will definitely regret it, although uh, uh, we are podcasting the event, so some people uh, rely on the ability of, of uh, watching the lecture afterwards, but it's, it's never like uh, being here. So thank you for coming again, and, uh, and uh, shame on us. It's so us that we don't have you know, more people than that interested in topics like art and uh, the history of art. Uh, I was telling friends that every time in this series of lectures we have moved to something beyond social sciences, more in literature or art and all that, uh, we got uh, uh, small audiences and I really regret that uh, uh, because, I mean, this should be part of, uh, of the uh, intellectual uh, interest of, uh, of, of, uh, of more people, I would say, if not to say, if not uh, everybody. In any case, we'll definitely have a very interesting uh, evening, I'm sure of that. Uh, and uh, our, our speaker tonight is uh, himself actually a, an embodiment of globalization. I don't know about time, <laughs> we'll check, but for globalization he is definitely because uh, Marcus Verhagen is originally from Belgium and uh, he, uh, he did, uh, I mean, studied at Cambridge University here, but then did his uh, 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 PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, in the history of art, that is, is uh, his, his topic. So it's already uh, uh, in, very much inserted in, in, in the topic itself, I mean, his, uh, his trajectory. And uh, let me think, uh, see my notes here. You wrote your doctoral dissertation on visual culture in France in the late 19th century. Very interesting topic, but then he moved from working on the 19th century uh, and also after teaching at universities uh, during his research in the United States and then in Britain, uh, <clears throat> he moved to working on contemporary art and very contemporary actually because now we'll be in the very, very contemporary uh, uh, forms of, of art. Uh, so Marcus, uh, uh, as you have probably read from his description on the posters, uh, teaches presently at the Sotheby's Institute of Art and at uh, Goldsmiths, I mean, University of London, our colleagues at Gold Goldsmith, has published in, uh, I mean, dozens of articles, so over 60 articles in uh, various uh, reviews uh, and journals. Uh, and the, the, the topic, uh, this topic today is, uh, I mean, you see, it uh, has a very puzzling title, uh, globalization and time would, would, would make you think that it's, it's some lecture on, the, I don't know, the sociology of globalization, but then the subtitle and the fact that he's an art historian uh, really gets it rather puzzling. And I'll, just to, in a way of introducing what he'll be saying, but uh, he will discuss, because he sent me some uh, short abstract, uh, the slow movement, you know, so, so we learn things, uh, I'm speaking as an ignorant here, uh, uh, and, uh, and precisely uh, this reaction against this uh, acceleration of time that is uh, at, at the very uh, heart and core of, of globalization. And I also regret that I can hardly see students even from the, my own course on globalization, but we are very much in that topic. There are quite there are a few. Uh, uh, we are very much in, in the topic here. So thank you very much, Marcus, for coming, and thank you all for coming, and welcome, Marcus, with me. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert, for, um, for a very generous introduction. Okay, so um, in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about uh, video art, globalization, and time. Uh, more particularly, 
I want to talk about the effects of globalization on our experiences and our understanding of time, and about the use of video as a means of tracking uh, and exploring those effects. Um, in museums and galleries today, we see more and more video work. Uh, and of course, video and film are unlike most other artistic media in that they have a temporal dimension. Uh, a video or film unfolds over time. Uh, so a work in film or, or, or video asks us to stop and watch and wait until the work is over. It commands and fills our attention over a period of time. Now I should say immediately that um, my own interest in this topic started in about 2005. In fact, it started when I went to see uh, a show called Time Zones at Tate Modern. Um, it was the first show at the Tate consisting only of film and video. Um, and it was very explicitly international in scope. So the works in, in the show uh, were made um, in locations across the world, in Mexico, Turkey, Indonesia, and various other countries. Um, and I thought um, I would show just uh, one work right at the beginning of my lecture, um, or a still from one work that was in the show. Uh, this is a piece from 1999. Um, it's called Zocalo, after um, the square here uh, in, in Mexico City. It's also known as the Plaza de la Constitución. Um, and around this square are various uh, government buildings. There's uh, the Supreme Court, the City Hall, the National Palace. Uh, all of them border on this square. Um, the square has also seen uh, many demonstrations. So it plays a, a crucial and rather complex role in, in the recent history of Mexico. Um, now here, uh, in, in, the, uh, in this work, um, which incidentally uh, lasts 12 hours, it's a single take, single 12-hour take. Um, and, and when you see it, uh, what, what draws your attention is the people who are standing in the shadow of the flagpole. Uh, people walk around the square, and uh, many people, as in um, this still here, uh, stop for a while um, to enjoy the shade uh, of, of uh, this, this shadow cast by the flagpole. Um, so here, Alice is he, he's effectively tracking what is uh, an impromptu human sundial. Um, and in doing so, he's crossing the time of history, um, the time of the Zocalo, um, the flagpole, the demonstrations, and so on, with um, the time of uh, the everyday, the, the time of quotidian experience. Um, so, uh, the show at the Tate left me wondering, can video, can video art illuminate the changes that globalization has brought to our experience or our experiences of time? Um, now, before I talk about specific artists and artworks and the answers they give to that question, I want to make a few uh, fairly obvious comments on a video and on how video organizes our impressions of time and space. Um, uh, in my view, the temporality of video has three dimensions. You have the duration, of, uh, the duration and the pace of the video. You have the temporality of the events that are described in the video. And then there's televisual time, the pacey, uninterrupted time of television, uh, of total flow. It's often called um, uh, the, the, the total flow of television. Uh, clearly, television, together with uh, commercial film and video games, um, television is, is a central pillar of modern culture. So necessarily, it colors our approach to the moving image today. Um, you could say that video art carries within it, ca carries televisual culture as a kind of phantom structure within it. Um, now, video is also a very attractive medium for artists who travel. And of course, today, most artists, or many artists, travel uh, constantly. Artists travel uh, more than before to study, to attend residencies, to participate in shows and biennials in faraway places. 
Um, and for many of these artists, the camcorder and a computer with uh, editing software on it now take the place of a fixed studio, um, in part because they're easily transportable. And as critics keep pointing out, video is the medium of choice uh, at biennials, at, at um, these mega shows that have become such important fixtures in the now global art circuit. In other words, glo the globalization of the art world and the rise of video art are mutually reinforcing trends. Uh, video is a, is a medium that has a, a privileged connection with globalization. All right, now I'd like to step back for a minute and think about the larger stakes here. What does it mean to look at the temporalities of the global? Isn't time experienced in broadly the same way from place to place and from time to time? Well, the short answer to that is, of course, no. Uh, clock time is a relatively recent invention. It's the result of the, uh, the rise of industrial capitalism and the availability from the beginning of the 19th century of cheapish timepieces. Um, it would seem that earlier, time was in general understood in more clearly experiential terms. Um, so many historians have argued, starting with uh, E.P. Thompson in his famous article on time and work discipline, which was published in 1967. Um, prior to the 19th century, according to, to Thompson um, and others, uh, time was parceled out according to agricultural cycles and, and according to the events of the religious calendar. Uh, different periods were seen as having different meanings and uses, and those meanings and uses varied from place to place. Today, on the other hand, we tend to think of time as empty in itself, as a measurable dimension of experience that itself exists independently of the experiences that fill it. We tend to think of time as essentially unvarying in texture, in density, in pace, and so on. We take this conception of time for granted, but we do well to remember not only that it's a relatively modern conception, but also that it has clear drawbacks, that it comes at a cost. And the cost of our understanding, of, of this modern understanding of time, uh, was clear. It was clear to um, other figures working in, in the 60s, like the situationist Guy Debord, um, who spoke of abstract, irreversible time, pointing out that time is now seen as resembling money. It's abstract and exchangeable. Today, we buy and sell blocks of time. Uh, package holidays, for instance. That's the example he gives. Uh, you, you might, uh, another example would be uh, the minutes per month we buy uh, on our mobile phones. Time has become a commodity. Time is money. According to the old ma maxim, time is money. And for de Boer, this wasn't a cliche, but a crucial insight into modern society. Uh, more recently, the cultural geographer David Harvey uh, spoke in, in, in fairly similar terms um, of time as abstract and homogenous, pointing out that the rise of capitalism required the very careful coordination of complex activities in different locations. Um, in other words, it required the synchronization of the sourcing of raw materials, the production of finished goods, and the distribution of those goods to distant markets. And to, to give you just one example of how far we've come, before 1883, a train traveling from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco passed through more than 200 time zones. The Pennsylvania Railroad, for instance, operated by Philadelphia time, which differed from New York time by five minutes. Um, so industrial, industrialization necessitated the harmonization of all such local temporalities. And as Harvey stated, as, as Harvey uh, emphasized, um, this process of harmonization required a new understanding of time, um, the understanding that time was universal and measurable. More recently, 
Harvey and others have pointed out that the processes of globalization are underpinned by new technologies that allow high-speed transport and communications. Globalization relies on, on quickened transactions and movements over large distances, and those transactions and movements are made possible by various technological developments, starting with the cybernetic revolution. This is what he calls time-space compression. Today, we can travel and communicate rapidly over great distances, and so expect to accomplish ever more in the same blocks of time. And as the French philosopher Sylviane Agassinsky has pointed out, globalization has harmonized the rhythms and temporalities of different states and regions. It's brought large areas of the globe uh, into line with Western notions of time, that's to say, with productive clock time. Agassinsky goes on to argue that one effective resistance to the current order of time is to spend, waste, or give time, to let it pass, to use it unproductively. Um, her, book, her book is titled Time Passing, Modernity and Nostalgia. Um, it was published in, in 2000. And it's, in my view, a, a little glib, but it's worth mentioning for two reasons. First, because um, it's been widely read in the art world, and secondly, because it's one of a very large number of recent books that have presented time as a battleground in the struggle to resist global corporatism and its effects. Um, I'll, I'll mention just a few of the other books. Um, you, you, um, you will probably have come across uh, some of them. Uh, Carl Honoré's In Praise of Slow is one. Tom Hodgkinson's How to Be Idle is another. Madeleine Bunting's Willing Slaves. Chris Moran's Hardly Working. Um, and most famously, Corinne uh, Mayer's Bonjour Paresse are others. Uh, Bonjour Paresse was translated in English as Hello Laziness. All of these books counsel against working too hard. Like Agassinsky, the authors enjoin us to waste time. Uh, Maya, an, an employee of the French energy conglomerate EDF, got into trouble, um, which isn't surprising with chapter headings like business culture my ass and passages about how to waste time at work and get away with it. Um, the energy, uh, the, her, her employers, uh, tried to impose uh, disciplinary action and failed. Now, I mention all this to press home the point that time is a crucial stake in uh, important cultural and political battles. Um, you might also consider the recent emergence of uh, time work balance as a political issue in this country. The debate in France over the introduction and then the partial repeal of the 35 hour working week. Um, the growing concern in Japan over the incidence of karoshi, that's to say uh, death from overwork. Or, or the overtime disputes that erupt on a regular basis in uh, companies around the globe. Um, those uh, th those disputes are, are nothing new, of course. Um, they echo battles between labor and capital in the 19th century uh, over uh, the efforts of managers to extend the working day through the introduction, for instance, of art artificial lighting, um, or other battles, still earlier battles, <clears throat> over the observation of St. Monday. Um, I, I don't know whether you've heard of St. Monday. And, um, in Britain in the 17th and 18th centuries and into the 19th century, uh, artisans uh, uh, were, for the most part, paid at the end of the week. So come Monday, many, many still had uh, money in their pockets and, and so stayed away from work. That, that's, that's what was once called St. Monday. Now, video operating in time can obviously insinuate itself into these debates. That was the founding premise of the show I mentioned earlier, Time Zones. Um, the curators clearly saw new temporalities as a crucial dimension of globalization and video as a means of highlighting, exploring, and possibly challenging those temporalities. Um, now, as, as this show demonstrated, uh, it's easy to lapse into a facile celebration of the slow. Um, and I'm going to give a couple of examples. 
um, st starting with this piece. Uh, now here, um, when, when this is shown, it lasts for 10 minutes, and you see virtually uh, the, um, nothing changes. It's, it's a static shot. Um, it, uh, it, it was, it was uh, done in Jakarta, and in the foreground you see a cemetery. This is where uh, the wife of Sukarno, Indonesia's first post-independence president, is buried. She's buried in this cemetery. Um, now, uh, the film was shown at 10 minute intervals. Uh, so for 10 minutes you would see nothing on the screen and then you would see this film which would last for 10 minutes. But uh, uh, there would be, you, you would see nothing move or almost nothing move. Every once in a while you would see someone walk uh, between the rows of uh, tombstones. So, um, very clearly, the artists here forced their viewers to adjust um, the pace of their viewing experience, their mode of attention, given that it was shown at these 10-minute intervals. You couldn't just walk in, watch a couple of minutes, and walk out again, as, as people so often do um, in, in shows featuring video art. Um, uh, you, you had to wait for a while to see footage that was shot and framed to exclude virtually all traces of movement. Now, in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, Adorno and Horkheimer speak of film as calling on the quick reflexes of men and women who were used to working with machines. In their eyes, uh, film, and, and they were thinking of Hollywood film, of course, film facilitated the internalization of the economic system. Uh, the slowness here in this work, on the other hand, can be seen as offering a model of attention that stands in opposition to the very rapid cadences of both uh, commercial film and TV and the modern workplace. Um, now, this film clearly shows two spheres. One, the foreground symbolically representing the temporalities of nature and the nation, given that Sukarno's wife is buried here. And the other, the uh, tower blocks in the background, uh, clearly representing the accelerated tempo of global business. It shows that the two exist side by side, that the local is penetrated by the global and vice versa. Having said that, the static camera, the near motionless screenings are all significant. The film is organized around these binary terms, um, the, the slow and the fast, the local and the global, but it's shot and framed to favor one side of the equation, plainly presenting its own slowness as a vindicating reflection of local cadences, local concerns. The piece is non-immersive. Um, our attention in watching it is initially guided by movement, but there are few movements, and what movements there are turn out to be unscripted. So the tendency inculcated by TV to read movement as directing meaning is frustrated. In fact, the piece comes across a little bit as a kind of animated photograph. And the artist, the, um, the work of Derek and de Roy is often seen as painterly. So why work in film? Why not make paintings or photographs instead? Well, presumably because film brings with it the expectation of movement, quick plotting, changing camera angles, and so on. It's by frustrating those expectations that the piece makes its slowness resonate as it does, that it fills its snow slowness with meaning. But there's something troubling to me about their symbolism, their pitting of the cemetery against the office block. It's a little facile. The cemetery is a place of refuge, the trees as offering a, a natural counterpoint to the concrete jungle that's springing up in the distance. These are, these are neo-romantic cliches. Uh, a similarly romantic vision is put forward in this work which consists of a continuous live feed of an 11th century Benedictine monastery in Baden-Württemberg. Um, here, the, the image, when, when you see this piece, 
Um, and I have a feeling that it's viewable over the internet. Um, when, when you see it, the, the image, a new image is uploaded every four seconds. So it sort of shivers every four seconds. And you see um, the trees moving in the wind, and that's about it. Um, again, th th this piece, like, like the last one, doesn't fill and monopolize the senses. It's non-immersive. The focus here is on the cycles of nature and devotion, but they're not visible to the naked eye. Um, the monastery here fulfills a similar role to the cemetery, uh, symbolic role to the cemetery in the De Reik and De Roy piece. It points to the time horizons of a pre-modern age, when the temporalities of nature and mankind were more closely attuned. Slowness here is presented as curative. Um, and um, I, I want to quote something Stehler himself said about this piece in an interview. Um, I wanted, this is Stiller speaking, I wanted viewers to consider how they experience time. We're all running around all the time. I wanted to make people feel aware, end of quote. But this is to skirt the issue of the medium, which surely gives this piece a, 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 a very particular slant and one that may not be in keeping with the curative tempo of rural or monastic life. As webcams aren't generally uh, pointed at largely motionless vistas, and their footage isn't normally blown up to fill a wall, as, as this is in the gallery. The viewer here is as likely to marvel at the technical novelty as, uh, as to reflect on the quiet unfurling of time in Comburg. A webcam confers immediacy. It allows you to see two places at once in real time. The webcam is used in video conferencing. It's one of many tools that have contributed to the ratcheting up of space-time compression, bridging space and so saving time for those who feel they have little to spare. So the work offers not just the serenity of slowness, but also the thrill of speed. That, that's to say it reminds us of the speed at which information is transmitted across great distances. So it could be seen against the grain of Stiller's comments and imagery as suggesting not that you can escape the global information society in remote places where life proceeds at a saner pace, but that the information society is tentacular and can embrace an isolated community in rural Germany just as easily as it can embrace metropolitan London or New York. Now, um, Gilbert, how am I doing for time? All right. Good. In that case, um, if I can, if I remember the instructions I was given earlier, I can show you here. I, I'm going to show you uh, um, a short passage from another work, a, a piece by Fikret Ate. Um, it's called Rebels of the Dance. It was shot in 2002 um, in Batman in southeastern Turkey, in a predominantly Kurdish part of Turkey. Um, Batman is uh, a city that has uh, become relatively wealthy in recent decades um, on the back of its uh, oil refining industry. Um, it's also a town that has a very, very high unemployment rate. Um, so let me show you a couple of minutes from this.
So, so in, this, in, in this work by Ate, we see these two boys. Um, they're performing what is presumably a traditional dance, though it also seems to have a, an improvisational element. And they, they perform it fitfully in stops and starts, often looking uh, self-conscious before the camera. Next to them is uh, an automatic bank machine, which acts here as, as an emblem for financial networks that operate with great speed, executing transactions almost instantaneously. Uh, according to the maxim I mentioned earlier, time is money. And this machine clearly saves money for the bank, which needs fewer tellers, and it also saves money for the customer. But the boys who stand and dance near the machine apparently have no use for it. Um, as the machine effectively reminds us, they are time rich and cash poor. They can't save money and they have no need to save time. Agasinski says that wasting time is an act, uh, act of resistance, but Ate's piece leaves me wondering, are the boys resisting the encroachment of an alien notion of time as symbolized by the bank machine, or are they simply unemployed? I don't think they're rebelling against productive clock time. I think they're just economically marginalized. For them, slowness is a deeply ambiguous prize. The work effectively reminds us that you have to upshift before you can fully enjoy the benefits of downshifting. Now, what is appealing about this work is that it doesn't, what's appealing to me, is that it doesn't romanticize the local and the slow. Recent video art has been too prone to offer worthy but flat and obvious meditations on the benefit of, sl of slowness. Meditations by artists like uh, Stähler or, or Dereke and de Roy, who've tended to gloss over the associations of video as a medium, its connection with TV and, and with commercial film, and through them with the global and the fast. And it's worth remembering that romanticizing the local and the slow is a common topos or tendency in commercial cinema. That's to say, it's a common topos in a certain kind of global culture. And I want to give you two examples. Um, this, is, this is a still from a, a film called Local Hero um, by Bill Forsyth, in which Mac, uh, seen here on the right, um, played by Peter Rygert, is sent to Scotland, to, to a small village on the Scottish coast, to buy land rights for an oil refinery. Before leaving Houston, Mac is seen driving his Porsche with the radio blaring, the very picture of the fast living executive. Max is a man in a hurry, but once in Scotland, he's won over by the villagers, including the old scavenger who lives on and owns the, uh, the beach that the oil company covets and, and who refuses to sell it to the oil company. Um, so, uh, um, Max, uh, sorry, uh, Mac becomes a different man. And, and the transformation in, in him is signaled by changes in his appearance. Uh, he drops his suits for woolly jumpers, for instance. Um, it's also signaled by his interest in a local woman and by his slowing down, his gradual adjustment to the slower pace of life and business in this village. Uh, a very similar message is conveyed uh, in, in the more recent film, A Good Year, 2006, in which Russell Crowe plays a London trader who inherits a vineyard in France. He wants to sell it initially, but he falls in love with a local woman and decides to give up his frantic London existence for a slower life in the French countryside. And uh, actually, there, there, there are many films that, that, tell, um, that tell a similar story. Um, and I mention them because I want to um, get across the point that this vision, this vision of slowing down, uh, this vision of embracing a, a different pace is part of the dream life of a fast-paced, globally connected society. Um, now, um, by way of conclusion, I want to discuss another work. Um, a work that I'm, I'm personally uh, very keen on. Um, 
Uh, and I want to show you the whole, uh, the whole work from start to finish. I have to quickly uh, change the DVDs. I understand that this may take just a second while the uh, DVD player uh, learns to forget about this film and here we go. I apologize for, this is a, a viewing copy. Um, try and imagine it without the writing.
so um, in this piece by uh, Laura and Calcedia, the turtles are, are, are static. Um, we see them against a changing backdrop in uh, the Pearl River Delta in China. Um, we see uh, river traffic, children playing on the banks, men un uh, unloading barges and trucks, and, and th th slowly the surroundings become more and more clearly industrial. Um, we, we see cranes, shipping containers, tugboats, a motorway in the distance, and finally a busy shipyard at night. Um, so the artists show here that old and new technologies, old and new industries exist side by side. Modern ships and old boats, modernist housing de developments and old shacks. Um, and throughout we see uh, the six turtles in a row on the log. Um, and, and of course turtles are an age old symbol of, of slowness. Um, and, and these, as I said, these, these turtles are near motionless. Um, but lining up on the log as they do, they can also be seen as forming a queue. And so acting as a kind of parodic reminder of the log jams and tailbacks that result from explosive growth. Um, now, at, at certain times, uh, we seem to get a turtle's eye view of the surroundings. Um, uh, uh, when we watch the footage of the banks uh, gliding by, uh, we seem to see them from the vantage point of the turtles, that, that the footage is shot from uh, a very low vantage point. And in as much as our gaze is aligned with theirs, we're implicitly invited to view the, the unfolding landscape as alien and unintelligible, which in a sense it is, given that industrialization in Guangdong province has been spectacularly rapid but uneven, turning the delta, as, as we see in the footage, into an anarchic patchwork of sweatshops and factories, slums and condominiums. At other times, the camera dwells on the turtles, which then look alien themselves, their immobility standing in very stark contrast with the buzz of economic activity on, on the banks. Um, what, what the artists show here is that in a globalizing world, different temporalities mesh and collide, that the fast tempo of global trade coexists with the different cadences of local activities. And that dislocation is repeated in the video itself, the camera work being smooth at some times and choppy at others, while the editing is alternately brisk and breezy. This is no facile defense of the slow. And I mention this piece because, like Atte's work, it suggests a subtler, more convincing approach to the temporalities of the global. These works are more convincing to me than the pieces by De Reke and De Roy and Wolfgang Stehler, because instead of positing some ideal world that stands outside the global net, uh, sorry, that stands outside global networks and operates at a saner pace, these works insinuate themselves into those networks, and there they create disturbances, disturbances in both the logic and the temporalities of global trade. Thank you very much. Now, Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Marcus, for this uh, really extremely captivating uh, lecture. And uh, I think I won't be speaking for myself in saying that you could have, you know, gone on and it was really captivating and actually felt it rather too much compressed in time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, to, 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 to deal with the topic, but really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, so, we have, as usual, uh, actually plenty of time for uh, uh, questions, remarks, discussion, whatever. Uh, so, since we are uh, also a small group, relatively small group, so uh, this can also provide more time if you wish to, to, to elaborate then having to just speak for two minutes. So, 
anyone want to? Yes, please. 